Thank you very much, Pablo. I am a bit moved. I will try to do my best in order to proceed with the presentation. The proposal is to, to organize my, my few words as follows. I would like to, to start by identifying which has been the space and time dimension of this research, then the thematic dimension. The third stage of, of the presentation will be focusing on offering a theory, of, a theory of international taxation which is implicit in this book and hopefully will be the, the focus of volume three. So at that stage, I would like to to present to you um, a theoretical framework, which is a two-sided platform, an idea invented by a French economist a few years ago. And this book aims to apply that new concept to understand the, the core logic of the international tax regime. Then I will say a, a few words on the quantitative analysis, which I produced with, with a I mean, crucial contribution of Martin Herson, who is here. Um, he's a member of the Department of International Relations, and we have been working very hard in order to, to try to understand I mean, what can be seen from data related to tax treaty disputes emerging over the last 92 years. And one important claim here is that we, we have seen a Copernican revolution going on over the last 92 years in this area. Then. I will move on to, to offer you a qualitative analysis that is encapsulated in the global taxonomy of tax treaty disputes. I understand you, you already have a copy of that. The question there is, what is the purpose of trying to bring order to tax treaty disputes emerging in the G20 and beyond over the last century? And finally, uh, I would like to think together with you what could be systemic implications of this research on law and political science. So the, the idea at the conclusions stage of this presentation is to see if there could be some implications both on, on, in both areas. Last but not least, this, uh, this work has been possible because of the contribution of prominent experts from 28 countries covering all continents. Um, so I would like to, to list the, the, the name of those people who have been working uh, with, uh, with, with us over the last five years. So in terms of space and time dimension, we are covering, probably for the first time in the literature, the G20 and beyond. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I say beyond, I'm referring to non-G20 nodes, which we think are playing a crucial role in the area of international taxation. And they include Cyprus, Hong Kong, Ireland, the Netherlands, Singapore, and Switzerland. For the reasons I will state, uh, we think that these non-G20 nodes are playing a crucial role in the strategic game in which countries are involved in the area of international taxation. We also include Uganda in order to see, to have a flavor of what has been the impact of tax treaty law in, in a poor African country. So we are covering 22, 27 jurisdictions and covering 92 years, since 1923 until September 2015. So just 30, 30 days before the G20 and OECD launched the BEPS report. In terms of the thematic dimension, we decided focusing on leading tax treaty cases only. Um, since we, we are dealing with countries that belongs to quite different legal traditions, common law countries, civil law countries, and com countries that are somewhere in between, it was very hard for us to agree on a global definition of tax treaty dispute, leading tax treaty disputes. So after months of discussions, we have been meeting in this very room over the last five years in October, we reached an, a, a global agreement on how to define leading tax treaty disputes, and we uh, decided to encapsulate a relatively objective definition. We understand by leading tax treaty dispute a dispute that has been quoted at least once by another court in another case. So we are leaving aside progeny cases. We are only focusing on, on leading tax treaty cases. 
we needed 1,500 pages to ground this central claim. So our book is basically supporting these few words. A new logic, we think, has emerged in the strategic interaction existing between G20 countries and non-G20 hubs in the last century. G20 countries increasingly compete against each other for capital, just as private firms compete for market share. So to make the story short, we see that countries are being behaving like companies in the area of international taxation in order to maximize the attraction of capital. And we think that the core structure of the international tax regime is a competition game. That is to say, we think it's a game in which elements of cooperation and competition are mixed. And we think that this game is implemented by means of something that is called two-sided platform. As I said, Jean Tirol is the inventor of this new concept. He received the 2014 Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of market power and regulation. So what we are trying to do is to think about the extent to which this new concept could be applied in order to understand the core dynamic of, of the international tax regime. So an example of a, of a two-sided platform is Google. So Google has designed a platform, which is a Google web search engine, which you, I'm sure we all normally use. What is fascinating here is that Google has two types of users, two different types of users. Users on site one, where we are normally located, Google web searchers. And on site two, Google advertisers, so companies, for example. What is remarkable, remarkable here is that we can see a number of cross-site neighbor effects and same-site neighbor effects. So the more individuals are using Google on site one, more companies will have an incentive to join this network, this network market. This is an example of a cross-site network effects. An example of a same-site network effect is, is the following. If Coca-Cola joins this platform, Pepsi-Cola will probably have the incentive to, to join it as well, in order not to give Coca-Cola a comparative advantage. What we can see here is a competition at the platform level. So, for example, Ian Roxanne has to choose between, between Bing or Google. Ian cannot use both platforms at the same time. So the competition in this market is at the platform level. So you may ask, what is the relationship of the relevance of this two-sided platform concept in the area of international taxation? To what extent can it explain something? Okay, I think that a similar logic is going on in the area of international taxation. At the top of the uh, platform, we can see the market leaders or quasi-legal rules. I'm referring to basically the G20 countries. So countries that are interested in maxi maximizing the size of international trade as much as possible. So they have the incentive to cooperate among them in order to create a platform soft law, which is now called the OECD model and related documents. That um, with the aim of that this platform, the OECD model, would maximize the size of international trade. In, in terms of the, the users of, the, of this platform, we can see on side one virtually all international taxpayers in the world who are looking for the best available location and timing and industry where to invest in such a way as to maximize their after-tax income. On site two are virtually all countries in the world and they are using this platform in order to maximize the attraction <laughs> of capital to their own jurisdictions. Let's see a number of same side and cross side network effects in the area of international taxation as far as we can see. So if we think about the wine industry, Argentina and Chile are central competitors. So if, if Chile joins the tax treaty network, 
will Argentina will have the, the incentive to do the same in order not to offer Chile a competitive advantage. That would be an example of same side network effects. Hmm? An example of, of cross side network effects could be the following. Hmm? As international investors normally like the OECD legal technology, countries have the incentive to base their tax treaty network on the OECD model because that's the legal technology preferred by, normally preferred by the international investors. Of course, we cannot put all countries on the same basket. The level of adaptation of this, this soft law into hard law depends on the market power of the relevant country. So for example, China has a larger market power than Kazakhstan. So arguably China has more market power to deviate from the OECD model than Kazakhstan. One important difference between the international tax regime area and Google area is that the sort of competition that we can see between the OECD model and the UN model is different from the competition between Bing and Google. Why? Okay, because when we're dealing with Bing <coughs> and Google, we are dealing with a competition among platforms. EM can only choose just one platform at the same time. Conversely, when we're dealing with the international tax regime, the competition is at the component level. So a given country may choose one element from the OECD model and other element from the UN model, and so, and so on. So here, unlike what is going on in the online market, market, the competition is at the component level. So, in consistency with our central claim, hmm, what we can see is that in bilateral tax treaties that G20 countries conclude with non-G20 hubs, the latter serves as outlet for the bundled products that G20 countries offer to international investors. So, for example, what we can see is that, um, okay, for example, in the area of, of um, in the case of, of Brazil, the usual gateway into Brazil has been the Netherlands because of cer certain peculiarities between in the uh, Brazil-Netherlands Double Taxation Convention. And the usual gateway from Brazil has been the treaty between Brazil and Austria. So there is a, a sort of joint venture between I mean, a G20 country and a non-G20 node. A similar logic can be seen in the, the interaction between South Korea and Belgium. Belgium is normally the gateway to South Korea. The Netherlands has been the usual gateway into the US. So it's fascinating to see this sort of strategic um, agreement between G20 countries and non-G20 nodes. So now it is time to, to, to apply this two-sided platform concept model to what has been going on since the 60s in the galaxy of tax treaty disputes. In this, in this chart that Martin and I have been producing uh, during the last couple of years, the, the black nodes represents G20 countries, for example, the US, while um, gray nodes represents non-G20 nodes, for example, Switzerland. The, the size of the node hmm, represents the the volume of tax treaty disputes involving that tax treaty emerging in other G20 countries. For example, the size of, of the US node represents the volume of tax treaty disputes involving the US tax treaty network emerging before non-US courts. So this is the 60s, this is the Beatles era, the Yellow Submarine era. What we can see is that there are um, basically two nodes, the US node, the German uh, node. Switzerland was by then the central sun of this galaxy. So presumably, US investors willing to, to invest in South Africa normally did it via Switzerland in the 60s. The, the thickness of, of the relevant lines 
shows the uh, relative proportion of disputes within the G20 tax treaty dispute universe. So for example, the US-Swiss tax treaty was most litigate, more litigated than the Swiss-German tax treaty in the 60s. And here we can see a number of countries such as Belgium, Austria, which presumably have been offering services to German residents in order to minimize their German tax liability. Now we're moving to, to the 70s, hmm? Queen, the Queen era. So here we, we can see that the system, I mean, the galaxy has changed. Hmm? The US is clearly, I mean, the, the market leader. The German poll is still there with an increasing number of, of smaller countries, presumably offering services in order to, to, to German residents in order to, to pay, to minimize their tax liability. Switzerland still is the uh, principal, the central non-G20 node. In the 80s, the police era, shall I say, so as you can see, one important element here is that there is clearly an increasing number of players. So an increasing volume of, of countries are willing to join this um, legal technology. One remarkable element here is that there is a the formation of the Anglo-Saxon pole, right? U USA, the US, India, and the UK, the German pole. Switzerland still is the central non-G20 node, but there is an emerging competitor of, the, of Switzerland, which is the Netherlands. In the 90s, Spice Girls, may I say that? <laughs> so again, an increasing number of, of countries, and it's, it's, it's very, very apparent. Hmm? So the Anglo-Saxon poll, the UK, the US, I mean, are very close partners. In the 90s, the Netherlands was most relevant than Switzerland as a, as a non-G20 node. One striking element emerging from the 90s is that the emergence of the Ibero-American pole. That is to say, Brazil, Argentina, and, and Spain, in which Luxembourg has been playing a, an important role. So now we have the Ibero-American pole, the German pole, the Anglo-Saxon pole, and uh, Netherlands as a the country with the highest market power as a non-G20 hub, and with two competitors, Singapore and, and, and Switzerland. And finally, the Adele era. So here, what we can see is that India was strong enough to create its own pole. So we have the Indian pole, the US pole, the German pole, and the Ibero-American pole. And all other countries are, I mean, closer to one pole or, or, or the other. And what we call the Copernican Revolution is this process according to which three non-G20 countries are at the center of the universe. So one may, may think that G20 countries are the, are the center of the universe and low tax jurisdictions are somehow orbiting G20 countries. With Martin, we have discovered that the situation is exactly the opposite, that at the center of the universe are non-G20 nodes, Switzerland since the 60s, Netherlands since the 90s, and Belgium since the 2000s. And virtually all G20 countries are selling their services and products via three non-G20 nodes. <coughs> so what is going on? How could you explain this dynamic? And I, I do remember a run I had with, with, with Pablo in, in Hyde Park, and I was very, very depressed because I was not able to, to understand the logic. And, and Pablo suggested this, this idea. Listen, Eduardo, he told me with a beautiful Spanish accent. <laughs> what if we consider that there is a reinforcing feedback between supply and demand? Pablo said. So countries should be seen as on the, on the supply side, while <coughs> international investors, particularly multinational enterprises, on the demand side. 
So countries are having a decreasing market power on the supply side due to new players, the emergence of new players in this game. For example, BRICS and beyond coming to the scene. This is an example of same side dental effects. So let's imagine a situation in which there is just one coffee store close to the, LS to the LSE. So that coffee store will have monopolistic power. It will have the power to, to increase the price of the coffee in a relatively high way. But now consider a situation in which the LSE I mean, is close to 10 coffee stores or 20. So the price of the coffee will probably go down. We think that something similar is going on at the international tax regime. Since international investors now have more countries where to invest, the bargaining power of each country has been going down. So we think that the net effect of this demand and supply interaction is the decreasing multinational enterprises tax entry cost and tax exit cost. And this is just the result of, a, of an increasing number of countries willing to receive capital. Now we will see a number of, of, of data in order to, to show the increasing competition among countries for capital and why on earth they are increasingly behaving like companies. This chart shows the number of leading tax treaty cases per decade since the 30s. So what we can see is something that could be called a, a tsunami of tax treaty disputes. As you can see, just five years, the first five years of the decade to, to starting on 2010, the number of, of disputes, of leading tax treaty disputes, is comparable to the volume of disputes emerging during the entire previous <coughs> decade. So what we can see, thanks to our research, is that there is a, a clear tsunami of tax treaty disputes. And we think this is a proxy to show increasing tax competition among countries. This slide aims to show the emergence of new players in this game. BRICS is, are just an example. So in the 40s, BRICS were non-existent. But as time went by, we can see that by the decade 2000, I mean, BRICS countries are as relevant or increasingly relevant vis-a-vis -vis OECD countries in terms of the volume of tax treaty disputes emerging on that part of, of the world. In a similar vein, we, we can see something that we call imperfect competition between states. And they may suggest asymmetric market power among countries or jurisdictions. We have classified um, leading tax treaty cases based on the outcome of the cases. So it could be for taxpayer, for government, or mix it. And one striking element here is that, I mean, all, in all tax treaty cases, I mean, the government prevail in China. So uh, we think that this is a, that shows the relatively high market power of China in here. France, at least on paper, it seems to be very pro-government. But in action, just just in about 30% of the cases, the government actually prevailed. So we, we think here it is important to distinguish between law in the books and law in action. This, in principle, could be seen as a law in action. And normally, if French courts have been deciding cases in favor of the taxpayer. This slide aims to show the imperfect competition between regions of the world. So we, we are dividing the world in, in four different groups. North America and Europe, Middle East and Africa, Latin America, and Asia and Pacific. And what we can see here is that North America and Europe has a larger market power than, say, Middle East and, and Africa. So what we can see here is that probably because of the uh, last global financial crisis, the tax treaty network has been used by tax authorities of the North America and Europe as a money-making machine in order to to face, I mean, the problem of fiscal deficit. So this shows, for example, that in in over 60% of the cases, 
in North America and Europe, hmm, the government has been prevailing, and something exactly the opposite has been, uh, been going on in Mid Middle East and, and Africa. So this slide aims to show that something that we call imperfect competition between regions of the world. Now it is time to, to move to the global taxonomy of tax treaty disputes. What we have done is to, okay, to, to read all the cases covered. I understand that you all have the, the taxonomy. So after reading over 1,500 cases, I am still married, seems <laughs> to be a miracle. Um, what uh, we have tried to do is to identify patterns of tax treaty disputes. So we, we identified uh, 116 patterns, which can be divided into three different categories. The green one are disputes on definitional articles, that is to say article one to five of the OECD model. Mm -hmm. The brown disputes are disputes on substantive articles, article six to 23. And white blue, disputes on procedural articles, is a article 24 to 31. This essential was inspired by, by a paper Ruben you wrote, you wrote about three years ago. I, 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 I read something like 5 a.m. in the morning when I was trying to, to, I mean, to find a, a classification. And yes, I am following your distinction. And what I'm doing here is basically to offer examples, in concrete 116 examples of the classification you imagined in that, in that paper. So, originally, this taxonomy was in, in black only. So I had a, a new run with, with Pablo, and Pablo told me with a beautiful Spanish accent, listen, Eduardo, this is too complex. You have to find a, a solution to, to make it simpler. I'm sorry for my Spanish accent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what I did is basically to allocate different colors. So green, which denote, I mean, they denote a definition of articles, brown, substantive articles, and white, blue, procedural articles. That's my response to, to Pablo's objection during that run. I mean, to, to allocate different colors. So, Sophie may ask, w w why is this relevant now that we, I mean, the best reports are there? And the same question asked my wife. <laughs> what is irrelevant? after, I mean, these years of work, if, if the world has changed. Thanks God, I found a response to that difficult <laughs> question. And my response is this one. The taxonomy has been signed as a test to evaluate on a periodic basis to what extent the 2015 BEPS report trigger structural changes in the patterns of tax treaty disputes in the pre BEPS reports era. So if we get together in 30 years time at the LNC, we will, hopefully, we will be able to check if new patterns have emerged and other patterns have disappeared. So we just, I just wanted, first of all, to find a, a response to my wife's question. <laughs> and secondly, to, to try to understand what has been go on, going on over the last century, to make it visible as much as possible. And th this was the result. So it is now, now time to, to offer conclusions from this work. The conclusion number one is that we think that the core archi architecture of the international tax regime is a competition game implemented by means of a two-sided platform. One beauty, I think, of the two-sided platform is that shows both elements, the elements of cooperation of G20 countries in the design of this legal technology in order to maximize the size of international trade, that's the cooperation element, and then it shows the competition element when each country transformed that soft law into hard law in the light of their own market power. So I think one beautiful element of the two-sided platform is that these two elements are there. The second conclusion is the systemic implication on law and governance, on law and political science. So in the area of competition law, what we can see is that, I mean, the international tax regime could be seen as a 
benign cartel, benign cartel among countries, in order to protect the tax base, in order to to avoid facing a Darwinian scenario. So it's a benign cartel among countries. And in the area of, of political science, to what extent voters should be seen as shareholders? To what extent international investors as consumers? This is not elaborated in, in, in this book, but it could be elaborated in volume three. I mean, to what extent what we are seeing in the UK, the pan devaluation, is an implicit breach of the contract between international investors and the UK, according to which the UK would be the gateway into the European Union. And because of Brexit, that contract is being implicitly broken. So some international investors are leaving this country because they are looking for a new gateway into the European Union. So to what extent international investors should be seen as consumers of a given country, for example, the UK as a great gateway to the European Union, and voters as shareholders. Should corporate governance principles be applied to countries? And finally, are the local and international tax systems playing different roles in the G20 political market? What we can see after reviewing what has been going on in G20 countries over the last century is that there is something that we call international tax posturing, in the sense that politicians are saying one thing to their voters, and they are actually doing something different. So we, we are mapping the gap between what politicians are saying and what they are act actually doing, and that's something that was discovered after doing this research. So what we plan to do, probably in volume three, is to take examples from, I mean, the UK and Hong Kong, the interaction between UK and Hong Kong, the interaction between Argentina and Austria, the interaction between India and Mauritius, and India and Cyprus, and the interaction between the US and the Netherlands. Last but not least, it is high time to say a word regarding the contributors. So uh, contributors from the OECD countries, I mean, US, Australia, Canada, Chile, European Union, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Netherlands, South Korea, Switzerland, Turkey, United Kingdom. These are the authors. We have been working together during these five years. Then contributors from BRIC countries, China, Hong Kong, Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa. And countries beyond the OECD and BRICS, Argentina, Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Uganda. Uganda. Yes, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia. It took it took us two years to find somebody willing to speak <laughs> on the Saudi Arabia because it is a taboo topic. It took us two years to find somebody willing to speak. Singapore. And at the global analysis, I mean, Ginger Lee, Martin Harrison, and I have been working on, on producing that global analysis, both quantitative and qualitative. And the Golden Bridge was produced by Andres Nobel, who is somewhere here. So we have been meeting on a almost a daily basis in order to, to see how to design the Golden Bridge, which aims to, to link tax treaty disputes with the relevant articles of the OECD model covering 1,000 tax treaty cases. Thank you very much for your attention, and now it is time to listen to the book reviewers. Thank you very much.